Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. But today we're going to build this pine cupboard. Lots of good storage area down below, some drawers, and even display storage up above. Now the inspiration for this piece came from a visit we made to England. I'll take you there next, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. Well, today we're in Polgate, not far from Brighton, on the south coast of the United Kingdom, at Graham Price Antiques. And I have the honor today of having him take us around. Hi, Graham. Hi, no one. Good to see you again. Let me see what I got on my list today. Uh, what I'm looking for is some kind of sideboard or a server with some storage below with doors and drawers, and up above some storage either open or preferably with some nice glass doors. You think oh, yeah. you have something? Yeah, we got things like that. Let's have a look over here first. Oh, I see a piece right there. Now, what can you tell me about that? This is a French piece in pine. It's uh, a buffet decor. Buffet decor, what does that this mean? It just means that it's in two parts. Splits here for movement, top and bottom. And what's this wood? That's not pine. No, that's some beech there on the, on the draw fronts and again up here on the turning. It's a nice piece, but I think it's a little bit complicated with these turnings and the fancy panels, and it's a little large for what I'm looking for. Do you Let's have anything have a look at some small? others? Yeah. Okay. Well, this place is really jammed up. We're, yeah. We're, we're sneaking over full. the bed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now amongst all this furniture, what's this doing here? It looks like some kind of well yeah, cap. Yeah, this is a French well head with its um, running gear. It's just a bit different, isn't it? Nice looking thing. Still works. Now, who's going to buy something like that? Well, it'll go into a garden or maybe get used in a film. Oh, so for the movie sets? Yeah, perhaps. Oh, now, these are the things that always catch my eye. I certainly could use one in the workshop. What can you tell me about this? Where did it come from? This is French, and it's from an ironmongery store. Each yeah. drawer there's got a brass and separate brass number on, you That's see. That's great. Now, these small, uh, small ones don't seem to There's two or three work. there that are fixed. And there's one on the corner with a keyhole, the only one that I see. Yeah, we think that must be for the money. The money, okay, have to have a safe place. So yeah. you've got one of everything here, it seems. Wow, now this, where's that here other cupboard? Here it is, the back here, this okay. cupboard. That's more like it. Is this English? No, this is Austrian. Austrian. Um, pine again, much simpler construction than the other one. Yeah, it is. More basic. But you know, it still has nice dovetail yes, joints on the drawers. And the joinery quality is good. It's solid bottom. Now, who'd have built something like this? This would have been made by the village carpenter. So, is it one of a kind? Absolutely, yeah. Just oh, made for one home. It's great. It's just about the right size. I think this would be the one. And I got here just in time because it's apparently already sold. Yeah. But it looks terrific, all polished and waxed. What do these pieces look like when they come oh, to you? Very different from this, but if we go along to the workshop, we can have a look at some. Okay. Graham, this is quite an operation. You've got warehouse space, workshop space. Where do you get all this stuff? Oh, we have um, suppliers out all over Europe, you know, in Ireland, and France, um, Denmark, <clears throat> hopefully soon in Eastern Europe. Oh, so they scout it out and yeah. bring it here and... Well, I go, I go look at it normally. Oh, you look at it? Yeah. And then it comes here and this is the sort of beginning of the process. This is the first part, yeah. Wow. What's this? This is an Irish... Um, dresser or hutch, typical from an Irish farmhouse from uh, the middle of the last century, but had lots of modern coats of paint on it, of course. Yeah, well, this is a, this certainly isn't ready to go out. To no, anyone. no, it needs a bit of work, yeah. We have to get it back to the wood. Now, where are those hutches that you said were like oh, the yeah. ones we were looking at? Here's one over here, look. Oh, yeah, I see Very it. similar to the one we looked at. Very similar. Um, has and obscured glass in it, of course, which we usually change for clear glass, because that's what people prefer. Huh. But you can see under the paint there the, the real color of the, the old pine. Yeah, it's the old pine. Fortunately, the inside isn't painted. Yeah. So then you're going to, do you take it apart? Well, <clears throat> the drawers obviously will strip separately and the, the doors will just take off. But otherwise, we immerse the whole carcass. Oh, it's hard to believe that goes. Change, change the hardware for something. Yeah, put something more, more appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Well, Graham, tell me, uh, what, do you, what did you pay? for something like this. That one cost 180 pounds in Austria, in that condition. Hmm. You didn't pay too much, did you? <laughs> Enough, but not too much. $400. <laughs> I can't believe for a moment that Graham Price paid any $400 for that old beat-up cupboard that he showed me. 
He's much too sharp for that. In fact, if I was trying to sell him this piece, he'd probably deal for quite a while. This is our version of the cupboard that we saw in his showroom. Now, I built mine out of number two pine because it has the small knots, which adds a lot of character to the piece. But more importantly, this is about one quarter the price that I would have to pay for clear select pine. Now, if you like the look of this cupboard and you'd like to build one for your dining room or for your kitchen, a measured drawing is available with the materials list. And you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now, before we start working today, I want to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now there's a lot to do on this project, so I've already glued up all the panels that I'm going to need. They consist of 1x8 and 1x6 boards that have been edge jointed so they're nice and straight. And I've glued them together and reinforced the joints with these hardwood biscuits. You can even see the end of one at this cutout. After the glue dried, I sanded them nice and smooth and cut them to the correct width and height. Now this happens to be one of the side panels. And down at the bottom, I have a cutout. And that's so that the whole width of the panel does not have to sit on the floor. Now to make that cutout, I laid it out and drilled some 7 8 inch holes in each corner so that I get a radius instead of a sharp edge, which might split. Now I have to cut along this line between the two holes. So I've set up a straight edge clamp, and I'm going to use my circular saw to cut that piece out. On the inside of those side panels, there's a series of dados and rabbits. And they receive either shelves or other cross members. The dados do not come through the front edge of the cabinet because I don't want them to show. I milled all the dados with the help of a straight edge guide and my router, which was set up with a half inch straight cutting bit. Now along the back edge, there's a rabbit for the plywood backing. That's made using a router equipped with a 3 8 rabbiting bit that has a ball bearing that follows the edge of the panel. Now with a little glue in the dado and on the end of the bottom shelf, we're ready for a little assembly. Now you'll notice there's a little cutout at the leading edge of the shelf. And I'll tell you what that's all about in a minute. The purpose of these clamps is to pull everything tightly together before I nail it. Now, it's a little trickier nailing the cabinet together from the inside, but you avoid the problem of having nail holes that show on the outside. Now, there's a couple more pieces that go in the dados and rabbits. This piece of one by three with biscuit slots cut in it to receive the draw supports sits in this dado, and I'm not going to glue it. I want to let the side move freely so it just floats. But this top piece will get secured with glue and nails. And you notice I've cut some dados, and those are for some cross pieces that I'll use to secure the top. Now this piece of quarter inch plywood for the back adds a lot of strength and it helps keep the dust out. The conventional way of finishing the front of a cabinet is to apply a face frame to the carcass using flat stock. But I noticed on the antique original that they had a laminated setup. And I like the way that looks, so I decided to carry it out on our piece. So in addition to the side panel, I'm putting a quarter inch piece then a three-quarter inch piece, which gives me the look of a post an inch and three-quarters square. Now, before I apply these, I want to make the mortises for my hinges and cut some biscuit slots to receive the horizontal rails.
The mortise for the hinge is made using a jig which has a window slightly larger than the hinge itself. And that compensates for the difference between the size of the collar and the edge of the bit. Now this handy little device cleans out the corners of the mortise. Now the laminated posts are held together by a little bit of glue and clamp pressure, no nails. With biscuits installed in the post, I can now slip in the rail that goes under the drawers and clamp it in place. Now this little piece is just a divider between the two drawers. And that takes care of the top rail. Now these are the drawer supports and this is one of the end supports. It has a little piece on the side to keep the drawer directing in straight. With the biscuit in place, I just slip it into the slots cut in the rails. I left myself just enough room to pop the back edge in and pull everything together. Now I'll just use a couple wedges to put some pressure on the joints until the glue sets. Now here's the center divider, which will guide the side of the drawer, attached with some glue and brads. On the top of the base cabinet, there are three cross pieces. And on one end, I've made a shiplap joint. Nothing fancy, just cut on the radial arm saw. And that will fit into these dados that I made in this rear rail. On the other end, there's a biscuit. And with some glue, that attaches to the front rail. Now the back is simply going to float in this slot. The sides will expand and contract. This will not stop that from moving. The top, which gets attached to the front and back rail, will help hold it down so that as you open the drawer, it won't tip out. Now this piece of quarter inch stock is simply a lamination to make the rail look a little bit thicker. Now this little one inch wide strip is a bottom rail that I'm holding down from the top edge of the shelf about three eighths of an inch so that the doors will have something to close against. Well that just about does it for today. We'll let that set overnight and tomorrow we'll build the upper part of the cupboard which is made just like the base except that it has a solid pine back. Then we'll make the doors, the drawers, and this decorative cornice. Good morning. I'm almost finished attaching the sides to the upper unit of our cupboard. The details are the same as the lower unit and everything is held together with glue and nails. These are the boards that form the back of the upper unit. Full thickness, one by sixes and one by eights. I milled a tongue in one edge, a groove in the other edge, and a groove at the bottom of the board. All that was done using my shaper, a tool that we don't use every day in the shop, but when you need it, you need it. Now for safety reasons, we unplug the shaper, and I can now rearrange the cutters to make the groove in the boards. To make the groove in the bottom of the board, I use my miter gauge, which is equipped with hold downs and the same set of cutters. Now to take the edge off the corners on the face side and give the piece a little bit of a decorative V-groove, I'm just using my block plane. There's no glue required here, just a couple nails in every board 
where the back meets the shelves. Now you'll note that I made a three quarter inch deep rabbet in the sides to accommodate the back. And this space, that's deliberate to allow the back to expand and contract a bit. Just a little dab of glue right about in the center of the back to hold this spline in place. It's one of those details that can't hurt. Here I'm building up the post for the upper unit, just like I did on the lower unit. Now the top rail is a little bit wider and it's held in place with some biscuits. I gotta work that in before I finish clamping this left hand post. Now this is a little decorative piece that we copied from the original. And here's where that decorative piece goes, just beneath the lower rail, and it's meant to be recessed in about a quarter of an inch. The frames for both the upper and lower doors are made the same way. There are vertical pieces referred to as styles, and they have a groove down the center. And there are horizontal pieces referred to as rails, which have a groove and a tongue, which fits into that. Now, the tongues and grooves are made exactly the same way as I did for the backboards. The only thing I haven't showed you with the shaper is how to make a tongue across the grain. I use the same miter gauge, but I put a backer block to prevent split out. Before I glue up the frames for the lower doors, I have to make the panel that fits in the groove. We're using the same 3 8 inch rabbiting bit that I used earlier. I've cut a rabbit around the edge of a 5 8 inch thick solid panel that will fit in the grooves of the rails and styles. Now the only thing that holds the rails and styles together is glue. Of course, there's no glue at all on the panel. You want that to float. All right, now we'll check it for square. Needs one little tap. That's good, and we'll set it aside to dry. Here's one of the upper door frames, and I want to set a glass panel in it. So I'm going to have to remove the material along this side of the groove. Then I'll be able to install a piece of glass and hold it in place with a small quarter round. To remove the material, I'm going to use my rabbiting bit. The draw construction features a solid pine front connected to the sides with dovetail joinery. The rest of it is made out of a high grade cabinet plywood, quarter inch that floats in the bottom in a groove, and the side is attached to the back with a dado joint. And that's what I'm going to make first. Now, uh, with the stack dado head reduced to a quarter of an inch in width, I can run the groove for the bottom. If a woodworker has a good dovetailing jig and a router, and he carefully follows the instructions that come with it, he'll end up with perfect dovetails every time. These holes are for screws, which will be used to secure the top. 
No glue, just screws here. A few biscuits will help align the upper portion of the cupboard with the lower section. All right, those biscuits align it. Now I'm gonna put a couple screws from underneath to secure it, and if you ever had to move it, you could take it apart. Now this is the first piece of the cornice. It won't be seen. It's just a piece of three-quarter inch stock that's been beveled back at a 15 degree angle. Now this next piece of the cornice I actually milled from a piece of one by five over at the table saw. It wasn't that difficult to do. Now here's a piece of stock that I've ripped to four inches to make our molding. Here's a finished piece of the molding. The first cut that I want to make is this back bevel and that's where it sits up against the side of the cabinet. So I've tilted the saw blade to 15 degrees and I'll just run the piece through on edge. The next cut to make is this one right here, which is parallel to the back cut. So I've just lowered the blade a bit. The next cut is right here, and that's a vertical cut. So the saw is back to 90 degrees. Now with the fence moved to the other side of the blade and the blade tipped to 40 degrees, I'm now ready to make this beveled shoulder cut. For the next pass, the blade has been tipped back to 15 degrees and I'll run the bottom edge. One more slight adjustment to the fence, and we'll make the final pass. Now this last piece is a standard molding right off the shelf at the lumber yard. It's called an inch and three quarter band molding. And it kind of pretties up the piece. Well, after fussing with the hinges a bit, we're ready for the finish. And we'll put the glass in after that. For a stain on our cupboard, I'm using a water-based product that the manufacturer refers to as Spanish oak. And it seems to be the closest thing we've found that comes to that English pine look. Once the stain has dried, we'll give it some protection with a couple coats of polyurethane. Well, here it is, our pine cupboard with the final coat of satin polyurethane, the nice brass hardware, and the glass in our upper doors. This is a very useful piece for the kitchen, dining room, or any place storage is required or display is desired.